In the vast pantheon of children's cartoons, there are few with the pedigree of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Danny Antonucci's surrealist vision of adolescent life in a nondescript cul-de-sac is lauded for its memorable characters, its timeless animation, and the consistent high quality of its humorous writing. With this combination of factors, it should come as no surprise that the show maintains a strong worldwide fan base to this day. Howard Phillips Lovecraft was an American author, made legendary for his stories that spoke of horrible cosmic monstrosities, unknowable earthbound evils, and the madness that waits below our polite society, threatening to burst forth at any given moment and pull mankind into a sepulchral screaming abattoir of our own making. When you clicked on this video, I'm sure that you had your doubts as to how there could be any sort of connection between the lighthearted misadventures of the Peach Creek children and the terrifying tales of one of America's most prolific horror writers, but I assure you that underneath the playful veneer of suburban life we've been presented is a tenebrous undercurrent of pure cosmic terror that threatens at any given moment to burst forth and claim our heroes as its own. To that end, I have compiled here a list of the seven most Lovecraftian episodes of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. For the purposes of our list, we will define Lovecraftian as the episodes dealing with themes of madness, cosmic horror, or unknowable malevolence. And for those of you who may ask what would make certain episodes in this list Lovecraftian as opposed to just being horror-themed, it's good clickbait, so just shut up, you're already taking this video way more seriously than I am. Also. One final word before we begin, this list will not be including the Halloween or Cartoon Network Invaded specials, as they're far too obvious. So without further ado, we begin with... Number 7... <laughs> nope, nope, okay, uh, commit to the bit, commit to the bit. <sighs> Number 7. Dueling Eds. Upon entering the yard, I was met with a sight that made the very blood in my veins run cold. There he stood, unmoving atop the Cyclopean monolith, not a word escaping from his lips as the children of the neighborhood gazed with rapt attention. But what made the sight so truly horrific was the Batrachian guise that covered his skin. I know not what comprised that accursed epidermis, but it enveloped his entire body so that only his face could be seen from beneath its blasphemous rising mass. I knew then that it was my duty to shake the other children from their delusion. A common theme in Lovecraft's writing is a fear of foreigners and their customs that may seem strange or even backwards to our point of view characters. This is a theme present in Dueling Eds, which opens with the neighborhood children gathering around to witness Rolf performing a strange ritual from his unknown homeland. However, when Eddie pushes back and profanes the communion given to him, Eddie soon finds himself entering a series of events that may just lead to his doom culminating in a final showdown that sees Eddie fighting for his life against the enemy now empowered by madness and the might of the ocean itself. The true horror lies in the final moments of the episode, when a shocking moment of body horror ripped straight from the pages of the shadow over Innsmouth befalls one of our heroes. These final moments are seared into the minds of countless fans of Ed, Ed, and Eddie for the same reason that Lovecraft's twist endings put him on the map and made his writings immortal. Number 6. Boo. Boo. Out goes the Ed. The coins in the jar glistened under the glow of the streetlight as it began to dawn on me. The madness was over. Our adventure moments from coming to a close. Rapture enveloped my mind as the realization that we were free from the horrors we had been suffering clouded me from fully processing what Ed was attempting to tell me. Double D was gone taken by the mole mutants he had warned us of. My celebration would be cut short regardless, though, as it was then that a hideous hand, covered in brown ichor, rose up from the sewer, the creature attached to it pulling itself towards us, the stench of decay hanging around it like a thick cloud. When a power outage causes the lights to go out in the cul-de-sac, the children gather in search of answers and respite from their fear of the things that lurk in the dark. However, Things begin to go downhill quickly when Ed riles the crowd up by revealing what he knows to be the cause of the blackout. Cannibal underground mole mutants. Double D may not be so quick to buy his explanations, but the other children prove much more easily influenced. Within moments, the cul-de-sac is plunged into a cacophony of terror, and all at Ed's provocation. 
And while the mole mutant's head speaks of may or may not be as real as he believes them to be, what is real is the horror of what man is capable of in a state of mass hysteria. Explored not only in classic tales such as Lovecraft's Nyarlathotep, but also the Twilight Zone episode The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. The speed at which we can abandon civility and descend into screaming madness provide an answer for those wondering what is the most terrifying entity of them all. It turns out it's man! Number 5. Look into my Eds. It was then that I wrested the tome from Edward's arms, shaking it as though I could somehow dislodge the answers to the questions that battered my very soul. As if in perverse response, a cruel jest from some unseen but all-powerful entity, something did indeed fall from the pages. Not the answers which I had sought, but instead a question far more terrifying. Given the chance to bend someone's will to my own, to replace their thoughts with mine, what would I do? A better man than I would have in that moment taken the damnable device and cast it into the hallowed flames of some holy pyre. Instead, I looked upon it and saw only grim opportunity. The episode Look Into My Eds begins when Double D receives a psychology manual in the mail. His interest in academic pursuits is mocked by Eddie until he discovers that the manual includes a special gift, a hypnotizing wheel. Upon spinning the wheel, whoever gazes into it finds themselves under the control of the wielder, unable to do anything but acquiesce to the demands given to them. This alone would be adequate grounds to tell a truly horrifying tale, especially due to the fact that it finds itself within the greedy claws of the power-hungry Eddie. But what truly pushes this story into the realms of Lovecraftian terror is the fact that the wheel's changes are not exclusive to its victim's mind. As the episode continues, we see Eddie and his friends force horrible bodily changes upon the children of the neighborhood, but none more terrifying than what is done to Rolf. From being compelled to contort his body in an impossible manner, to even becoming a soulless undead, Rolf is helpless as he becomes a mere plaything for the Eds and their new unholy powers. But worry not, dear viewer. As by the time our story comes to a close, the Eds themselves experience their own all-too-ironic punishment for disrupting the laws of nature. Number 4. Who let the Ed in? In that very moment, I could only stare in disbelief and horror at the demoniacal sight that was playing out before me. In our prior foolishness, we had thought Ed's mental affliction not but the subject of mockery a piteous flight of fantasy that otherwise could do no real harm. But now it was all too clear. Whatever dark forces Ed had conjured up to bring this jib to life, it now stood before us, unseen but all too real, and as it exacted its terrible vengeance upon Eddie, causing everything I thought I knew about the universe to collapse around me, a singular question began to reverberate in my mind. Which one of us would be next? Who Let the Ed In is the tale of Ed's new imaginary friend, Jib. When Ed first reveals Jib's presence to Eddie and Double D, they're willing to indulge him and even play along. But when Jib's hold on Ed's mind gets in the way of Eddie's plans, things quickly begin to take a dark turn. From small pranks like lobbing a ball at Eddie's head when he isn't looking, to far more sinister trespasses, Jib soon goes from being an imaginary friend to a very real danger. In the vein of so many classic horror stories, Who Let the Ed In leads the viewer on, making us question the entire time whether Jib is truly real, or if these violent actions are being undertaken by Ed himself, his mind slipping as a result of exposure to horrific tales of disembodied spirits. It all comes to a head in a climactic explosion of supernatural violence as the unseen threat exacts its horrific vengeance on Eddie for daring to come between him and his host. Number 3 one plus one equals Ed. The thread that Eddie had been tugging at had now unraveled Jimmy's shirt completely, and yet, it did not end there. Impossible as it seemed, the thread was somehow woven into Jimmy's very skin. I stared in disbelief, my hands trembling from the mixture of anticipation, dread, and a damnable curiosity. I could tell that we were all thinking the same thing, and before any of us could speak, Eddie pulled. I dread to recollect what happened next, as if doing so would confirm the horrific and impossible sight that I beheld, but I owe you the truth. Eddie 
had pulled away Jimmy's outline. Fondly remembered by many fans as one of the show's best episodes, One Plus One Equals Ed tells the story of what happens when the Eds begin to question the very nature of the world around them. But as they say, curiosity killed the cat and what begins as a simple journey to answer the question of how things work soon begins to descend into an odyssey of psychedelic terror as the very universe begins to unravel around them. From Eddie taking away Jimmy's outline, causing him to melt into a sludge that is drained away into a nearby sewer, to watching Rolf grow two extra heads, more and more impossible occurrences take place before the Ed's eyes culminating in a climactic sequence that must be seen to be believed. And when it is all over, the viewer is left questioning whether any of it truly happened at all, or if they were not but the sick delusions of three boys slowly descending into madness. Number 2. Hand Me Down Ed The moment Eddie ran by and ripped the object from my hands, it was as though a tenuous cloud had been lifted from over my mind. The hellish heat that had engulfed me only moments before was gone, and in its place, a horrific realization. Whoever I had been only moments before was not myself. I dare not say what state my body was in once my soul had returned to it, but as the change began to once again manifest itself in Eddie, I realized the common factor in our mania. The boomerang. Hand Me Down Ed is one of the two most explicitly supernatural episodes of Ed, Ed and Eddie, as well as being one of the most Lovecraftian dealing with a cursed artifact that drives people to madness with it merely by making physical contact. When a mysterious boomerang flies into Peach Creek from some unknown source, viewers soon learn that this boomerang is not just some cheap souvenir from somebody's trip to the outback. Everyone who touches the boomerang begins to find themselves changing, contorting in both body and mind until they are nearly unrecognizable. Rolf finds himself unable to stop singing out a strange song even as he's in clear distress. Jimmy's gentle nature is stolen away as he is seemingly possessed by some violent entity intent on destroying everything around him. And Double D undergoes such a horrifying change that I'm not even sure I can show it on YouTube. Dealing in themes of eldritch unknowable antiquities, infectious madness, and repulsive body horror, Hand Me Down Ed is a quintessential example of Lovecraft's influence on Ed, Ed, and Eddie, and would easily be the shoe in for the number one position were it not for... Number one. Sorry. Wrong. Ed. Lying there in agony underneath the cart which had crashed into my room only moments before, my thoughts drifted, as if in search of escape from the pain. And as they did, I remembered the strange ritual I had witnessed Rolf performing before I had interrupted and stolen the phone for myself. The record. The spring. And now the impossible attack of the possessed cart. All taking place moments after answering that very phone. It was so obvious now. This was no simple piece of decoration, but some otherworldly magnet for misfortune. Sorry Wrong Ed begins as the Eds witness Rolf ritualistically burying a golden telephone in the alleyway, his face riddled with fear. Eddie's confusion quickly turns to greed and he decides that he needs the phone for himself. Ignoring Rolf's warnings, Eddie waits for Rolf to leave, then digs up the phone and steals it. However, it isn't long before Eddie learns the hard way that Rolf had good reason to be trying to rid himself of the phone. As a strange series of coincidences pile up, each occurring moments after Eddie answers calls from the phone, it becomes clear to both Eddie and the viewer that this phone is cursed, and that Eddie, as its new owner, is in very real danger. Eddie's paranoia begins to grow as his friends prove not only unhelpful, but actively making the situation worse. Double D refuses to acknowledge the events happening before his very eyes, insisting that curses are not real while Ed continues to take calls from the phone despite Eddie's pleas. With nobody on his side, Eddie sinks further into fear and madness. The culmination of this voyage of terror is a plot point that I will leave unspoiled, but those who have seen the episode for themselves can attest that the themes of paranoia, cursed artifacts of unknowable origin, and madness mean that Sorry Wrong Ed is easily the most Lovecraftian episode of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. And with that, We've reached the end of our list. From mass hysteria and madness to genuine supernatural evil, 
Ed, Ed, and Eddie is a show that revels in Lovecraftian terror, no matter how much it attempts to hide the fact behind a veneer of irreverent humor and jokes about buttered toast. But now that you have been cursed with this knowledge, it is your burden to spread it to others by showing them this video, so that our little cult can grow. For now though, we must go our separate ways. But before we do, I have one final thing to say. This has been a paranormally pointless video, and I hope it brought madness and terror.